This is the product that sent Intel on a multi-year journey to fix their reputation, but also may have cost Intel billions of dollars. Not only in R&D, which they spend about 4 billion per quarter across all market segments, but the brutal downturn to its stock immediately after the launch of this thing. That is over $100 billion wiped out in six months, which this at least contributed to in some way. We are of course talking about Arc GPUs, arguably one of the most important releases in graphics over the last God knows how many years, because even if you wouldn't consider one, which we will find out if you should soon, the sheer fact that this even exists disrupts the market and attempts to keep the other players in check from persistent and inevitable anti-consumer practices, which is exactly why. Even with rather glaring issues at launch, which we'll get into in a bit, this thing got at least some level of recommendation from most reviewers. Very competitive, really good value judgment for the A770 of those games. It's just that it's not consistent. Overall, the A770 and A750 genuinely impressed me on numerous occasions during my testing, and there's certainly real potential for Intel to become a genuine third competitor. If you're the technical type, and don't mind rolling the dice once in a while, I'm asking you to give Intel Arc a shot. A recommendation I suspect they never would have given to a competing product from a competing company all because of the benefits of its mere existence. So in this video sponsored by our friends at ASRock and Intel, I'm going to show you the importance and the story of Intel Arc, the initial performance and issues, how that has changed since then, and how Nvidia might be selling more of these than anyone else on the planet, which may be the most pro-consumer thing they have done in quite some time. Let me explain. It's common knowledge at this point that the fewer companies you have in a competing market, the more chance there is for some level of corruption. And we've seen our fair share of this over the years with two companies, which is a bad situation to be in. But there's nothing you can do if there are no other options. So clearly we need more manufacturers. But building something like this is extremely complex, not only in the process of manufacturing from a hardware perspective, but also supporting and developing upon it to be a viable product that consumers will invest in. So realistically, Intel is one of the only companies that could even compete in this space, and arguably the best company to come in and disrupt the situation for three reasons. Number one, their history in graphics actually spans back to the 1980s, before I was born, and almost 10 years before Nvidia was even founded. Number two, more people globally are running Intel graphics due to their many year dominance in the CPU space because most of their mainstream processors contain a graphics coprocessor, so they have plenty of experience. And number three, maybe the biggest advantage that they have over the competition is they own their own manufacturing facilities, though that's not the route that they went with these cards. Like their competition's current generation, they are made at TSMC, but moving production in-house would allow them to be more flexible and potentially reduce the cost in manufacturing. So after many months and many millions of dollars, we have Intel Arc, released soon after one of the most prolific supply chain shortages we are likely to see. Realistically, all they needed for a win was decent performance at a good price. So let's have a look at what happened next. I can't recommend you take the gamble on either the A770 or A750. We can't recommend this card, period, for the wider audience. But when it comes to raw performance, there are clearly some problems here. And realistically, they were pretty spot on. In fact, let me show you some interesting behavior and explain why it's happening. Because a lot of games worked well, right out of the box for most people and offered a great experience. This is Cyberpunk 1080p High using October 2022 drivers. And it looks pretty great. But then this would still happen. Yep, that smoke just obliterated the FPS on this poor cart. That dip is far lower than what's reasonable. So some games are flawless, some are hit and miss, and others made it onto the community-driven incompatibility list. That is a big oof. And games were not the only issue. Arc Control, used to optimize the cart, had many of them, if you could get it installed at all. So what's going on here? Why is the company best set up to do this running into these issues? Because without problems, these cards would be really easy to recommend. Everyone wanted to recommend them because of what they stand for. A compelling price, lots of memory, especially with this A770 16 gigabyte, and there's even a low profile model of the A380, an entire fingertip 
bigger than this card, which could be an excellent low-cost AV1 encoder for game streamers. All fantastic selling points. But the way that I see it is there's two things about these cards that are the most important to know. First, rebar matters and can dramatically improve everything. Here's why. First, what is resizable okay, bar? Resizable bar is a pretty weirdly named PCI Express feature. And what it does is it allows transactions that originate on the CPU, like reads and writes, that are targeting GPU memory uh, to be bigger. So basically, if resizable bar is off and you're trying to read or write a large memory region, you're gonna do a lot of little transactions. Our memory controller on our, on our GPU happens to like uh, fewer, bigger transactions. Turn rebar on. So for many people, Getting a massive performance boost and increased stability is as simple as going into the BIOS and enabling a setting. A setting that's often recommended to turn on for any GPU, not bad at all, and works natively for Intel 10th Gen and AMD Zen 3 processors, or even older with supported motherboard and a BIOS update. But the second most important thing to know is how Intel implemented DirectX, which is the tools developers use to build their games, and one of the main reasons why frame rates tanked in certain titles. Intel didn't implement hardware DirectX 9 support, instead using a software-based translation layer for these older games. Think of this like emulating a PlayStation 3 or something else on your computer. You can get a good end result, sometimes a really good end result, but compared to playing directly on the console, the experience is going to be a little clumsy and unoptimized. You really have to rely on the brute force performance to make up the loss in the translation. And this works well a lot of the time until it runs into something that cripples it, like the smoke effect. Great frame rates, then boom, then back to gaming. I even kind of understand this decision, but I feel like Intel just didn't properly weigh how important Direct9 was. You see, a lot of these games are really old at this point, and if it increases the cost by a significant amount, while also not being that beneficial to that many people, the unoptimized software-based solution makes a lot of sense. It will see you through. The only problem is DirectX 9 titles are some of the most popular games in the world because they run great on lower end hardware. Let me show you a few because it is not just CSGO. Half-Life 2, Left 4 Dead 1 and 2, Mass Effect 1, 2 and 3. There are nine Need for Speed games from the original Underground all the way to Hot Pursuit seven years later. Portal 1 and 2, fantastic games. GTA 4 to San Andreas, and Assassin's Creed 1 to Revelations. That is just to name a few of them. But CSGO being the most popular game is the game that got the most attention with these performance issues. So a pretty rough start for the cards that were meant to be the chosen ones, the ones to bring choice and balance to ever increasing prices and poor competition in a market where we mostly feel like we're being taken advantage of and deprioritized due to AI to the point that even with these issues, the fact that they were not Nvidia or AMD was enough to give them some level of recommendation from most and enough to get people to switch and support the ARC efforts. And I totally get it. Nvidia's behavior and AMD's to a lesser extent has been an obvious and major contributing factor to a lot of people going for Intel ARC despite these issues. Even I've been on the record many times complaining about the behavior I see. We need to make it so it's more profitable for these companies to make pro-consumer decisions than anti-consumer decisions. And how competition is realistically one of the only things that can help and keep everybody above board. But I've also been sure to not intentionally gloss over anything because one, it's the right thing to do, and two, it would destroy your trust in me. There is no benefit for me doing that. So the recommendation has been do it, thank you for helping us all, and good luck, because we need this to work. But realistically, the rest is in Intel's court now to try and make this a better solution for the most amount of gamers. So enough of where we were, the issues of the past. What about today? Has their performance gotten better? Are they a viable alternative for most gamers? Because month after month, you see articles like these, videos like these, and the push of so many drivers to try and make this a better experience. Everything else aside, I really cannot commend Intel enough for how focused they seem to be and the community engagement efforts to keep everyone informed. They have not gone unnoticed. Which means I have a selection of games that I want to show you. 
comparing old drivers close to when Intel Arc was initially released, specifically the A770, and their newest drivers nearly 20 months later. Let's see how hard those developers have been working. So given that Arc seems to have very different performance based on which graphics API is used, and also how their translation layer is being utilized, I thought the best thing to do was test the performance difference for five games, DX9 through to DX12, and also Vulkan, because Arc's performance was never really the complaint. It was its consistency. And random older games, but still popular games, were having issues because of how Arc implements its drivers. I obviously can't test every game, but performance gains per graphics API are likely to be at least somewhat transferable to other games using the same API. So let's see which games are getting the biggest improvements. Starting out with Cyberpunk, which being a newer DX12 title ran great, even using our 20 month old drivers. I think this is a good example of when Arc works, it works well, because raw performance, basically the same. Upscaling and ray tracing, basically the same again in 20 months of updates. Though I did test AMD's FSR upscaler as well as Intel's XESS. And although their performance in balance mode was basically identical, Intel's upscaler did a much better job on some of the more complicated elements in the scene. But this performance in newer games is pretty much expected as the games that got the most attention and needed the most work were much older titles. So let's go back to DX11. Rainbow Six Siege was one of the games that Intel struggled with at launch, and using older drivers, it really does show. Within our 20 month timeline, we saw pretty much a doubling to its performance, both in average FPS and all important 1% lows. But that doesn't even fully represent the difference here, as during my tests, this game crashed quite a few times with the older drivers, but I did not have an issue with the latest. I even decided to test this game twice, as you can use DX11 or Vulkan, which provided an excellent experience, even with the older drivers. But upgrading to the newer ones did give us around a 4 to 9% increase, depending on which figures you're looking at. Bioshock using DX10 textures was something that gave us a much bigger uplift in performance using the newer drivers, especially for 1080p gamers. That's about a 20% uplift in average FPS and 10% more for the 1% lows. A decent uplift for 1440p, but really does pale in comparison to the 1080p performance increase. But the game that caused the most controversy had one of the biggest improvements, CSGO. And I wanted to specifically go back to that smoke effect that these cards seem to struggle with, because even in Intel's own marketing material, you can see that the smoke effect is something that's bringing everyone's numbers down. So unless you can get a consistent amount of smoke per benchmark run, CSGO performance data on this is basically meaningless. So what I decided to do was use the community benchmark for consistency and record the lowest FPS through this smoke effect, as this will likely be useful information for any DX9 title that uses this effect. And again, 1080p high is where this card pulled away from the old drivers by just under 15% during the smoke effect, but a decent uplift to performance across the board. I also wanted to test the A580 as they are one of the few GPU options below $200. But as that card will likely follow the same patterns and performance uplift as the A770, I decided to see if it was a viable solution for modern esports games. So I ran CS2, PUBG, and Overwatch 2 at 1080p. And against some of the most popular games on Steam, this is what I like to call a dollar card, as in it costs about $1 per frame, performing really well. That's about 150 to 200 FPS in Overwatch 2, PUBG, and CS2. So where does that leave Arc now in 2024? It's undeniable that Arc had a pretty rough start. And if it were a couple months further along in terms of drivers at launch, while also coming to market a few months earlier, I think we would all be having a very different conversation. Intel have clearly made stability and performance improvements over the months, and a lot of work is paying off because for most people, for most games, art does offer a good experience. But if you have an older or less popular game in your library that is a real deal breaker for you, it's still best to get a first-hand account on that. But I am genuinely excited to see where this goes and all of the positive outcomes from having another option for users. 
because I cannot be alone in feeling like our interests are largely what got GPUs to where they are today, but we are swiftly becoming second-class citizens, making a third player even more compelling. And speaking of, if you own an art card, please tell me your experience below and how that has changed over time. Reading your comments will be extremely useful for anyone considering one. And if you want to know the best cards right now, well, you can check out the best value GPUs to buy, where we have in-depth breakdowns of all GPUs covering all budgets. And you can check that out by clicking here. Otherwise, guys, share, like, subscribe. They are always appreciated. And I hope you have an amazing day.